the, the, the heart of this series is that we want, we want us to experience transformation from the inside out. God wants us to experience life and life abundantly. And that comes as we allow him to do the deep work within our souls. And really the heart of this, the big goal of this is that we can raise families that love and honor God. Amen. We can have marriages that, that stand the test of time and every assault that the devil would throw at it. That we can have a, a, a mental health and sanity and joy in our own lives. And that comes as we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and transform us. And that's really the heart of this series. And if you missed last week for whatever reason, you can always uh, listen online and catch up with us. Um, but last week we talked about how our enemy, the devil comes and his primary assault against all of our lives is to insert lies. He comes to speak lies to us and to get us to live in a way that is apart from the will of God, separate from God, independently of God. And we have to begin by first identifying what are those lies that we've been led to believe. And for all of us, especially if you didn't grow up knowing the Lord, there were probably a ton of lies that we were led to believe growing up. And once we can begin to identify those lies, we can replace it with God's truth. But this morning, we're going to continue that thought because the problem with lies is it's not just a mental thing. It's not just something that stays in our head. It affects the way that we live. And all of us need to co cope with those lies and, and do things to deal with the things that we're believing. And so in your notes here, it says this. There are essentially two ways to live. The Bible describes these two ways. We're either going to live by the flesh or by the spirit. There's two ways to live. Either we're going to live by the flesh or according to the flesh or according to the spirit. And we're going to break this down for us this morning. It says here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 25, this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia, kind of uh, talking about this whole concept here. He says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. We're called to be free, free from the, the sin that would entangle us, free from the lies of the enemy that would pull us away from the will of God. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not uh, to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. But the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and it's just all negative stuff, right? And envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I won't go into detail on all those, but these aren't things that are, are going to lead to life. It's not going to lead to the joy and the, the blessing of God. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's talking about the fruit of the flesh, right? Then he continues, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy, it's peace, it's forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What the Bible is trying to show us here is there are these two ways to live. Either according to the flesh, which bears the, the fruit of the flesh or the results of the flesh, all of these negative things that we see in our own lives, we see in society, maybe we see in our neighbors, our coworkers, maybe, right? But it's, it's just everywhere, all of the negative stuff, right? And we can look at the world and go, man, how come there's so much negativity? Why don't we see the joy and the peace and the blessing of God? And the Bible tells us here and in other places that it's because we are living by the flesh rather than living by the Spirit. We are living according to what we as humans think is right and what our, our desires, or we talked about last week, our appetites want rather than what the Spirit of God wants. We shouldn't be surprised then when we are experiencing all of these, these negative consequences in our society, the breakdown in the family, depression, suicide, you know what I mean? All the negative things that we hear about continually, it's a result of us living according to the flesh. I mean, we can even just think about in our own home, right? When we're yelling at our kids because they're not doing their homework right, or we're yelling at our spouse, or whatever it is, it's, it's all the fruit of the flesh because we're operating out of what, what's going on in my own heart, my own emotions, my own soul. But the, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, all the good stuff, the stuff that we want and we want our kids to experience and grow up in and we want to see in the world, that comes as we live not by the flesh but by the spirit. And so there's this tension, there's this dualism, that, 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 that there's this opposition that's going on inside of every single human being. Either I'm going to live according to my flesh, what my desires are, or I'm going to choose to live according to the spirit and what God is trying to do in me. The problem is, I wish that there was just a magic wand or when you, you know, come to faith in Christ and you pray a magic prayer that all the flesh stuff goes away and we are just miraculously full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness all the time. How many of you would love that? Man, I would love that. 
And, you know, I remember when I first started coming to church, I, that's what I thought would happen. So I would, you know, receive prayer as often as possible. I'd say, pray for me. I got this problem. And I'd have people pray for me. And, but I was still as insecure, still as anxious, still as angry, still as all the negative stuff was still in there. Well, why is that? Because the Bible tells us that we have to make a choice to live by the Spirit rather than live by the flesh. And not just one choice. We have to make repeated choices, thousands of choices a day to live by the Spirit rather than by the flesh. So some of us right now, our flesh wants to pull out our phone and check our football scores. That, that's the flesh, okay? Put, leave it in your pocket. And by the Spirit, choose to engage with, with what God is saying right now. That's a choice. It's a small choice, right? Some of us, as we're driving home today, you're going to have the choice to, you know, give somebody, you know, the, the other shaka with the one finger. You know what I'm saying? On the road, right? That's a choice. Or we can choose to live by the Spirit and say, I forgive you in the name of Jesus. You must have not learned how to drive well. I forgive you. Amen. Right? We have a thousand choices every single day to live by the flesh or live by the Spirit. The problem is many of us for, for years and years of our lives just live by the, by the flesh continually over and over and over again. And depending on how old you are, 30, 40, 50 years old, those things become habits in our lives that are hard to break. And so the, the middle finger is just common. You know, it's just normal. You know what I'm saying? This is not as easy, but the other one is super easy, right? Or, or reacting in anger or, or, or lust or whatever it is just comes natural to us because we've been living by the flesh for so long. So when we come to faith in Jesus, it's going to take time to learn to live by the Spirit rather than live by the flesh. But I've got good news for us. God is, God is with us, and he wants to empower us to live by the Spirit so that we can bear the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And isn't that what we all want? I don't know about you, but I want more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all the other good things in my life. And the Bible tells us we can have that if we make repeated choices to live by the Spirit rather than live by the flesh. I used to wonder, God, why can't I change? Why do I still have all of these negative emotions? Why do I still have all these uh, negative tendencies or negative habits? God, why aren't I changing? I've been coming to church. I've been going to group. I've been reading the Bible. Why aren't I changing yet? And it wasn't until I began to realize that I have to make repeated choices. They start small, but then they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then transformation begins to happen in our lives. It's the choice to live by the Spirit rather than live by the flesh. So walking in the flesh, just a couple things about that, is living independently of God. That's what walking in the flesh is. It's living independently of God. It's saying, God, I don't want to depend on you. I don't want to depend on your Spirit. I don't want to do things your way. I'm going to do things my way because it's familiar. It's comfortable. It's this desire to live independently of God. And the roots and then the fruits of that are the, the acts of the flesh, sexual, sexual immorality, impurity, all the, all the negative stuff we talked about. Dr. Neil Anderson writes this in his book. I just want to read it to you. This small quote. He said, ultimately, every act of sin stems from people's attempts to meet their own needs. Listen to that. To meet their own needs, establish their own identity, receive acceptance from others, seek personal security, and search for significance independent of God. That's the root of sin. That everything that we need, we do it independently of God. Notice he's not saying that those needs are bad. Our needs are real, right? All these needs that we have. But when we seek to get those needs met independently of God, that's what walking in the flesh is. And that's what leads to the, 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 the negative things that we talked about. He continues on. Uh, acting, like, acting like gods, we struggle to gain acceptance, security, and significance through physical appearance, performance, and status. Any threat to our security becomes a source of anxiety or anger. Every manifestation of sin from negative attitudes to hurtful actions stems from one root of all sin, namely the desire to play God over our own lives. And that's what living independently of God is. I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to gratify my flesh my way. I'm going to get success my way. I'm going to cover up for my insecurities my way. And whenever we do that and live independently of God, sin is very close. And the negative consequences of sin are very close. Walking in the Spirit, in contrast, is living in a relationship with God and dependence on God. That's the difference. We're going to announce, it, rather than doing things my way, I'm going to say, God, how do you want me to handle this situation? How do you want me to handle these anxieties, these fears, this depression, this, th these negative thoughts? How do you want me to handle these appetites in my flesh? I desire, you know, I desire sex. I desire this. I desire that. How do you want me to handle these appetites, God, rather than just what culture tells me or what my, my flesh naturally wants? That's the difference between walking in the flesh and the spirit. Are you guys following me so far? So, I want, to, I want to throw up a couple of diagrams here because, you know, we, we kind of talked about this in the last series, but I want to take it a little bit further. This is, this is what we're kind of calling the soul diagram. Go ahead and throw that up. So you've seen this before. We are made up of body, soul, and spirit, right? And the soul is this part of us that we're talking about bringing transformation in. Our body is all this external stuff. 
The spirit is what comes born again when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord. But the mind, the will, the emotions, the soul takes a long time to change. It takes a long time to change. And so here's what happens. We were meant to live, go to the next slide, with God in the middle. The Holy Spirit's supposed to be in our spirit, filling every area of our lives. But the problem is most of us, all of us, in fact, we're not born knowing God. In, in fact, the Bible tells us we were born separated from God. So go to the next slide. We don't have the Holy Spirit in our lives. Next slide. And then what ends up happening is for the rest of our lives, go to the next one, we're trying to now deal with life with all kinds of stuff. So in our, in our emotions, we experience lust, we experience guilt, envy, anger, anxiety, all kinds of negative emotions, right? And so we, we cope with it. In our mind, we have negative thoughts. We have uh, bitter thoughts, lustful thoughts, prideful thoughts, angry thoughts. I mean, you just name it. What's going on in our minds? All kinds of negativity because God's not the one that's leading us. And then we act out in our will. We either with addictions, with sex, with control, with avoidance, and you can fill in the list with your own experience, but our soul is filled with all kinds of negative stuff. Now, here's what happens. When we come to faith in Jesus, go to the next one, the Holy Spirit comes in, and we become born again. You're a new creature. If you were to die today, you would go to heaven, not because you've cleaned up your soul, but because the Holy Spirit now lives inside of you, because you said yes to Jesus. That's the gospel. But here's the problem. We still got all of this negative stuff in our soul. You see that? And then we wonder, man, I, I, I read the Bible. I see what my life is supposed to look like. I see this love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, a, a sound mind, you know, all of this good stuff. Why aren't I experiencing it? The reason why we're not experiencing it is because of all of this negative junk that's been built up in our soul for our entire lives. Are you guys following what I'm saying? So, if you, so, you know, that, that's, that's why it's a, a good, good idea to have our kids in church while they're young. And, and to raise them well so that hopefully they don't develop all this negative stuff in their soul that when they're 30 years old, they then can deal with, right? Hopefully, we're raising them to learn to depend on the spirit at an early age rather than live in the flesh for 30 years and then have an aha moment one day and not want to change. Because the problem at that point is there's years and years of habitual negative behaviors that we've learned. Isn't that true? And for many of us, that's your experience. Some of you didn't come to faith in Christ until your 50s or your 40s. And so change is going to take time. And so be patient with yourself, amen? And, and by the way, be patient with one another. Don't look at, you know, don't look at the, the person sitting next to you or, you know, whatever and be like, hey, you've been in church for two weeks. How come you never change yet? <laughs> bro, I've been living in the flesh for 40 years, bro. Give me, a, give me some grace, right? And that's what used to stress me out because I, I would hear testimonies of people come to church, someone prayed over them, and man, their addiction to cocaine, gone, right? I'm like, wow, that's amazing. How about my addiction to, to fear? To anger and anxiety. How come that's not gone? And I would get all upset. God, how come you're not changing me the way you changed that person? And I realized God, is, God works a process in our lives of learning to depend on the spirit rather than the flesh. So don't look at one another. How come you're not changed yet? It's a process. But the, the, the point we got to get at is, are we engaging with the spirit or are we just continuing to live in the flesh? Are we now seeking God for his resources and how to deal with our stuff? Or are we continuing to live in the old patterns of flesh that we've lived with all of our lives. And here's the hard thing. Those are comfortable for us. We know that when we're stressed, I just lash out in anger. That's a quick way to shut my wife up. Huh? You know, when she's not doing what I want or my kids aren't doing what I want, I just scream at them. That's a quick, easy way to deal with the problem, isn't it? Actually, the reality is, no, that's going to make other problems a lot worse, right? But, but that's just normal to us. It's just habitual to us. Or when there's a conflict, I'm just going to run away. I don't want to deal with it, so I just shut down. I just avoid it. I'm just not going to deal with it. That's a quick, easy way to deal with my problem. The reality is, no, that's just going to make other issues worse. You see what I'm saying? Or, or substance abuse or sex or whatever it is that makes us feel better. That's all the flesh that ultimately is not going to lead to the life that God has for us. So here's what's supposed to happen. When we let the Holy Spirit in, go to the last one. No, not that. Well, who's that? That looked good. Um, we go to the last one there. Now we're allowing the Holy Spirit to begin to deal with all of these areas of sin in our lives, all of these areas of flesh that we've allowed to build up over the years. And it's one by one. It's day by day. It's moment by moment. It's choice by choice. Not to go back to whatever I th was comfortable for me all these years. And so we have to ask ourselves, what, what do we rely on in the flesh to deal with our negative emotions? What do I run back to? What do I go to in moments of stress, anxiety, fear, whatever that is? What do I go to? Because that's that area of the flesh that, that, that God wants to fill, that he wants to heal us from so that we can live the lives that he's calling us to live. I don't know if these diagrams are helpful to you. They're helpful to me, so I do it for myself if nothing else. But hopefully it blesses you. All right, now look at this. In your notes here, it says this. In the flesh, we develop habits and patterns of living to cope with life. 
in the flesh, that's what we do. We develop habits and patterns of living to cope with life. And another good way to think about this is these are our fig leaves. In Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, we see the way that they responded, right? We talked about this a little bit last week, but verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. They realized there was something wrong with them because they had now rejected God and they sinned. So look at what they did. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Fig leaves. And uh, if you've ever seen a fig leaf, it's not a very suitable covering um, for your, you know, body. So anyway, it's not, it's not adequate. It's not going to cover you. It's not going to protect you from the elements. It's not going to cover our shame. But that's what we do. We cover ourselves. We cover our, our, our anxiety. We cover our fears with things that ultimately aren't going to protect us. That's what the flesh stuff is. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8. Then the man heard, and the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And this is one of the saddest lines in all of Scripture. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. All of us have fig leaves in our lives that we use to cover our guilt and our shame. Our guilt are areas that we know we've done wrong. Shame tells us this. It's not that you just did wrong. It's that something's wrong with you. It's not just that you made a mistake. It's that you are a failure. You are fundamentally flawed. No one will ever love you or whatever those identity issues are. Guilt says you made a mistake. Shame says there's something wrong with you. It's an attack on your identity. And all of us in our lives have a certain element of shame in us that we deal with. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not handsome enough, pretty enough, fit enough, whatever it is. I'm not talented enough. Or I'm not worthy of love. Am I worthy of love? My parents abandoned me when I was young, or I was abused when I was young, or this and that happened when I was young. Am I fundamentally worthy of love? God, do you love me? And these senses of not feeling good enough, we have to cover that up. We can't live our lives feeling that way, right? And so we find ways to cover that up. The most obvious ways that we cover up our, our guilt and shame are through addictions, right? Where we, I'll, just, I'll just get drunk then so I don't have to think about it. Or through sex or whatever it is, all those negative addictive behaviors or whatever. But the least obvious ones but are equally as damaging is sometimes we cover up our shame with good stuff, with virtues, with things that seem positive on the outside. Sometimes we can cover up our shame with achievement, success, uh, money, power, status. We say, if I, if I get to this level of success or achievement, then I'll feel good enough. The reality is that can still be a fig leaf. If I just achieve enough, if I just succeed enough, and whether, whatever, whether we realize it or not, we cover up with negative things, but we also cover up with positive things. Because what did I say in the beginning? Living in the flesh is living independently of God. It's I'm going to do this in my own part. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to show everybody that I matter. I'm going to prove to the world and prove to my parents and prove to whoever said negative things about me that I matter, that I'm better than them, that I'm worthy of love. And so we do all these things on the outside. And sometimes we don't realize it, but we drive our kids to cover up their shame with, with success. Just do better, perform better, achieve more, and then you'll be worthy. The problem, the problem with that is this. We can't always win. Isn't that true? What happens when you lose? What happens when you can't be successful? What happens when you're not the smartest or the best? Then we revert oftentimes to alcohol, drugs, or other things to cover it up. But you see, all of this is living independently of God. That's what Adam and Eve did. They said, I'm going to cover up my feelings of guilt and shame without you, God. And so they sewed fig leaves together. Again, stuff that could never ultimately satisfy them or, 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 deal, or deal with their problem, they did. And that's what we do all the time. What are some fig leaves that you can identify in your own life? What are some ways that you've used to cover up your own guilt, your own shame, your own feelings of inadequacy? The obvious ones are, again, substances, drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever it is, right? But the least obvious ones are sometimes I'm going to show them. I'm going to achieve more. I'm going to do better. I'm going to work harder. Now, those things aren't wrong in and of itself. But if we're using that to cover up this feeling of inadequacy in, it, in ourselves, it's going to lead us further and further from the will of God. Because you can achieve all the success, but if you haven't dealt with the soul and the stuff that's going on on the inside, eventually there's going to be a blow up. That's why you can see the most successful people in the world still get addicted to drugs and commit suicide. Isn't that true? I mean, we see that in our world. You can see the most rich, most successful living in the nicest mansions, but their marriages are falling apart and they're having multiple affairs or multiple families. Why is that? Because the soul issue hasn't been dealt with. Success didn't actually heal the soul. It just covered it up. It's like trying to put a Band-Aid over, you know, cancer or something. It's not going to heal it. It's still in there. You may feel better for a moment. Oh, look, I, I, I did something about this. No, but it's still festering on the inside, and it's killing you. 
So our achievements, our success, our, our, our vices, our drugs, our alcohol, it covers it up for a moment, but it's still in there. The difference is we need to open up to God and let him deal with our feelings of guilt and shame. You guys following me so far? What fig leaves or coping mechanisms can you identify in your life? What do you run to when there's negative emotions? What do you run to to deal with the feelings of guilt, shame, and negativity in your life? Because until we identify those things and open up to God, those things are still going to fester inside of our soul and will eventually, could eventually wreck the things that really matter in our lives. One of the ways we can identify our fig leaves is to ask ourselves this question, what do I do when I experience a negative emotion? What do I do? What do I run to? Do you run to God or do you run to the bottle? Do you run to God or do you run to a relationship to process the pain and the, and the anxiety and the fear? Do you run to God or do we run to, I'll, I'll just do better, I'll just achieve more and ignore what the root of the issue? I'll do one more diagram for you. Hopefully this helps. But go ahead and throw up that, that next slide, the negative emotion cycles. Here's what happens. We have some kind of negative incident happen to us. Something negative happened. For Adam and Eve, the serpent lied to them. And they, you know, they said, they told, the serpent told Adam and Eve, God doesn't love you. He's holding out on you. So they had a negative emotion. Something inside of them felt weird. Rather than running to God, they ran to a negative thought. That's right. Maybe God is holding out on me. Last week we said Eve, Eve looked at the fruit and it seemed good for food and pleasing to the eye. And then she went to the negative action. She took the fruit. She ate of it. Many of us, we, we, maybe you've experienced abandonment. Maybe you've experienced uh, uh, abuse at a young age, that negative incident. And it created a negative emotion in you. When my dad got arrested because he was a drug dealer, I had a lot of negative emotions that came out of that. I didn't know God, so I dealt with it with negative thoughts. I believe lies about myself. I believe lies about God. I believe lies about life. And those led to a lot of negative actions and coping mechanisms. And here's what happens. You get stuck in a cycle of continuing to believe negative things and continuing in this negative cycle. A couple weeks ago, we shared a testimony of, of uh, one of our young adults, Jarek Rivero. And he was addicted to cocaine. Well, where did that come from at a very young age? It came from believing lies about himself and because of negative emotions that happened because he was bullied and he was abandoned by his parents. Essentially, his parents were divorced. And he was trapped in this negative cycle for years. So how do we break out of this negative cycle? Go to the next slide. Oh, no, don't go to the next slide. Just kidding. But you get trapped in a negative cycle. And many of us may find ourselves there today. So here's what do we do in your notes here. Open up, don't cover up. Open up, don't cover up. Rather than trying to cover up with fig leaves, trying to cover up with substances, trying to cover up with behaviors that will just make us feel better for a moment, open up, don't cover up. We are designed for a relationship with God and to depend on him, not on our flesh. What if Adam and Eve had come to God and said, God, we screwed up, we messed up, I'm covering up, help me. Many people believe the world would be very different today. But instead, look at what happened, verse 11 of Genesis chapter 3. God came to them. He said, who told you you were naked? Now watch what's happening here. He's asking them to process with him their negative emotions. What's going on in yourself? Why, did you, why, why are you feeling anxious? Why are you hiding from me? Why are you covering up? He wants them to process that. Talk to me about this pain. Talk to me about this anxiety. Talk to me about this fear. But instead of opening up, they covered up. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The easiest answer would have been, yes, we did, and we are sorry. Help me. That's what all God probably wanted in that moment. Yes, I messed up, God. Help me. But look at what the man did. He's given this opportunity to come clean and open up. The man said, well, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. It's her fault. It's always the woman's fault. I'm just kidding. That's what he's saying. I don't know what I'm saying. It's usually my fault in my marriage. Anyway, I don't know about you. Uh, then the woman, the woman, and look at it, he's blaming God. You gave her to me. It's your fault, God. Actually, this whole thing, your fault, God, because you gave me the, the wrong wife. I know none of us have ever thought that. You gave me the wrong spouse. That's why I'm in this mess, God. This is ultimately your fault, right? Then the Lord said to the woman, okay, well, maybe you'll tell me the truth. What is this that you have done? She said, well, the, the serpent deceived me. By the way, the serpent that you made, God, notice no one's opening up. No one's being honest. Everyone's deflecting and blaming and saying it's someone else's problem when God is saying, just tell me the truth. Tell me what's going on. Tell me the pain inside of your soul. Open up. Don't cover up. But all of us have been trained over years not to open up because when you open up, you might get teased. When you open up, you might get ridiculed. You might get rejected. You might get fired. You might get this. You might get that. So just cover up. Just keep covering up. And Satan keeps us in this negative cycle that we've been in. We're trapped there because we just won't open up. What if Adam and Eve had opened up? A whole lot of things could have changed. So let's go through the next slide here. So what do we do when we experience a negative emotion? Go to the, the next cycle. Instead of going down into the negative thought, the negative actions, 
is now we change our thought life. We talked about this before. God, what do you think about this? We come to God. God, what do you say? That's what a sanctified thought is. God, what do you say? The serpent said to eat from the fruit of the tree and that you're holding out on me and that you're lying to me. God, what's the truth? And we go into a new cycle. Go to the next slide. We go to sanctified thoughts, which lead to sanctified actions. Now I'm not living based off of my flesh, but spirit, what do you want me to do? God, how should I respond to this feeling of guilt and shame and anxiety, depression, whatever it is? And then now go to the next side. What do you want me to do? Now, what, what, uh, sanctified actions, which then will lead to sanctified emotions, which then creates a new cycle. Rather than the negative cycle of, of negative thinking and living that we've had all of our lives, now we break out of that into a new cycle of living. That's what, that's what Galatians 5 was talking about, living by the spirit rather than the flesh. The left side, this is all flesh. This is how we lived all of our lives, this new side. Now, God, what do you think? How do you want me to act? And then eventually our feelings will come along with it. It's a choice in the moment. But I want you to keep this slide up there. It all starts here. In that, in that moment of that negative emotion, when you feel rejected, when you feel angry, when you feel anxious, rather than going down to the negative thought sp spiral, Saying, God, what do you think? What do you think? And then saying, God, that negative incident, that thing that happened to me when my dad got arrested, is that because you didn't love me? No, it's not because you didn't love me. It's because the devil is a liar. That moment when you were abandoned by your parents or when you were sexually abused or when whatever that negative thing happened, is that because I'm not worthy of love? That's why I've gone through this? No, it's because the devil hates God's creation and wants to destroy it. And now we get out of that negative cycle, and we can move on to the positive cycle. But it's a choice to live by the spirit, not by the flesh. And in every moment that we give into the flesh, we get back into this negative spiral, and we make it worse. But we can make a choice when those negative emotions arise to believe God's thoughts rather than our own fleshly thoughts. And the new cycle can begin. And I, I love this, verse 21 of Genesis chapter 3. The Lord God then made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. From the very beginning... God's desire was to cover us. Don't cover yourself. Come to God and let him cover you. Don't cover up your own guilt, your own shame, your own negativity. Come to the Lord and let him cover you. And that's what it means to live by the spirit rather than by the flesh. Last week, I, I introduced you to the story of Nick Vujicic. Nick Vujicic uh, was born with no arms and no legs. And we said if anyone ever had the, the, would have had been justified in feeling like God didn't love them, it was him. He literally came out of the womb with no arms and no legs. I mean, he had, he had no chance to live the, the normal life that most of us get to live every single day. And he wrestled with, God, why did I go through this? Do you not love me? Is that why I've been born this way? And he wanted to commit suicide. And he attempted suicide on at least one occasion because he thought, man, I'm not loved. He was trapped in that negative thought cycle. But as you're going to see in this clip in just a moment, the truth began to break in and allowed him to break into a new cycle, which gave him a new life. But I want you to put yourself in his place and feeling like all of our inadequacies, all of our problems, God, is this a result of, of you not loving me? How can I break out of that into a new cycle? Take a look at this, this, this clip. There's a couple of clips, one from CBN and then one from uh, 60 Minutes. And uh, I just want you to see how we can break free from the enemy's lies and believe God's truth. Take a look at this. My dad was saying that he was, you know, his head was next to my mum's head as, uh, as I was being born. And he saw my shoulder and he just went pale. And he was hoping my mum didn't see me because he saw that I had no right arm. And my dad had to leave the room and he couldn't believe what he saw. And the doctor came in and my dad said, my son, he has no right arm. And he says, no, your son has no arms or legs. And he said he nearly fell on the floor. He couldn't believe it. And the whole church was mourning, you know, like, why would God let the pastor's son be born that way? And my mom, at first, she, just, she didn't want to hold me. She didn't want to, you know, breastfeed me and all that. Um, she just felt very uncomfortable for the first four months. And it took them quite a while before they could trust in God that he didn't make a mistake, that he didn't forget them or me. Nick's parents gave their fear and even disappointment in their son's disability over to the Lord. They chose to trust God and his promise that he had a plan and purpose, a hope and a future for their son. But as the years passed, Nick, on the other hand, had many challenges trusting in a God that he felt gave him less. And so I wanted to end it. If God wasn't going to end my pain, I was going to end it myself. So at age eight, I tried to drown myself in a bathtub 
or four inches of water. I told my mum and dad, I'm just going to relax in the bathtub. Can you put me in the bathtub? And uh, yeah, I turned over a couple times to see if I could do it. I couldn't do it. Um, the thought that stopped me from going through with it was the love for my parents. Um, because I, I love them so much and all they did was love me. And I thought to myself, if I actually went through with this, I pictured my funeral, I pictured my parents, and also was guilt on their shoulders that they couldn't have done more. That would be the last time Nick would attempt suicide, but it wouldn't be the last time he would come face to face with those deep issues that made him want to end the pain. Then one day, Nick's mother had him read an article about a severely disabled man. And that man's story made a huge impact on Nick. <laughs> I have a choice to either be angry at God for what I don't have or be thankful for what I do have. And my mom, she said, Nick, God's going to use you. I don't know how, I don't know when, but God's going to use you. And those seeds started penetrating in my heart. And that's when I started seeing that there is no point in being complete on the outside when you're broken on the inside. And I found out that God can heal you without changing a circumstance. I gave my life to Jesus Christ when I read John 9 at age 15, where a man was coming through a village and a man, um, this, this blind man from birth, Jesus saw him. People said, why was this man born that way? Jesus said it was done so that the works of God may be revealed through him. And in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, it says, all scripture is God breathed. And I believe God breathed in me life and faith. This faith came over me. This peace came over me. And I felt like God answered my question. It's so hard to be strong when people constantly say, you're not good enough. You, you know, go away. You know, we don't want anything to do with you. Nick, you're a nobody. Nick, you can't do this. Nick, you can't do that. Nick, 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 Nick. In life, if you don't know the truth, then you can't be free because then you'll believe that the lies are the truth. But once we realize that when we read the Word of God and you know the truth of who you are, I am not a man without arms and legs. I'm a, I am a child of God. I am forgiven of my sins. I'm an ambassador of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm nothing but a servant of the Most High God. This is not about Nick. It's not about Nick's capacity and capability to become this conqueror. I am nothing. Mm -hmm. I'm nothing. God, though, lives in me, and I now live in his strength. And whatever Jesus conquered, I conquer. I believe if God doesn't give you a miracle, you are a miracle of God for somebody else's salvation. And I thank God that he didn't answer my prayer when I was begging him for arms and legs at age eight. Because guess what? Because I have no arms and no legs, he's using me all around the world. And we've seen so far, approximately, uh, this is conservative, 200,000 souls come to Jesus Christ for the very first time in the last six, seven years. And what would you rather? Would you rather have arms and legs, Nick, here on earth and no arms? No whatever his will is, because I'd rather have no arms and no legs temporarily here on earth to be able to reach someone else for Jesus Christ and then spend eternity with them there. In the last decade, Nick has shared his story in 24 countries to over 3 million people. And whether he's talking to a stadium packed with people or one single person, his heart behind the message is the same. God loves you that he hasn't forgotten your pain, he hasn't forgotten your family. And maybe while you're watching this interview, you've compared your suffering to my suffering. And that's not where hope is, to know that someone else, in your opinion, is suffering more than you. That's not where hope is. But hope is in the name of God, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope is when you compare your suffering to the infinite, immeasurable love and grace of God. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength that shall mount up on wings as eagles. I didn't need my circumstance to change. I don't need arms and legs. I need the wings of the Holy Spirit. And I'm flying because I know Jesus is holding me up. Don't give up on God, because God will not give up on you. Going to the beach. Yeah. Yeah. Down to it, 
Nick Vujicic has simply led his life by example. For this man and his remarkable wife, a handicap is only as big as you make it. Now with the backing of a loving family, Nick has taken himself to the edge and not only survived, but prospered. Nick, over 10 years ago, we sat on the beach and I asked you what your dreams were and you said to fall in love and to have a family. Did you picture it like this? Well, I did fall in love and we are in love and, and this is the most incredible life that we could ever, well, even to, it's even beyond our dreams. Come on, let's give God praise for that story. I don't know about you, but Nick Vujicic inspires me. But did you notice that pattern, though? He was trapped in a negative cycle of feeling like, I'm, well, I'm not loved. God doesn't love me. Look at what I've gone through. Look at what I'm going through. Will I ever have a hope? Will I ever have a future? And if we stay there, we're letting the devil win. But it was, it was his mom and it was the church that encouraged him, no, God has a purpose for your life. We don't know what it is, but God is not done with you yet. That got him into a new cycle of believing God's thoughts for him, which resulted in God's actions. He started to serve others and bless others and, and encourage others with his own pain. He wasn't healed. He wasn't transformed. But he was encouraging other people with his own pain. And God wrote a new story, began a new cycle in Nick Vujicic. Sometimes we get so trapped in this negative cycle that that's all we can see. And we say, God, until you change my circumstance, I'm not going to follow you. Or until you change my problem or make the problem go away, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to follow you. And that just keeps us trapped in that cycle. It doesn't, our, our lives don't change when our circumstances change. Our lives change when we believe God's word over our flesh. I'm going to say that again. Our lives don't change when our circumstances change. Our lives change when we believe God over the lies of the enemy and the flesh. Nick began to believe God's word over the lies that he's been told, and God wrote a new story. I was wrong last week. I said he had two kids. He actually has four, uh, two boys and two twin girls, and God is writing a whole new chapter in his life because he chose to believe God's word over the lies of the enemy. If God can do that in Nick Vujicic, I think he can do that in you, your life and in mine, don't you? If God can redeem a life with no arms and no legs, completely helpless on his own, and give him far more than he ever thought he could have. I'm pretty sure he can redeem your story and my story. The question, like I always say, is not can God do something with my brokenness. The question is, will we trust him? The question is not can God do something with my pain. The question is, will I choose to trust in him and his word over my flesh and over the lies that I've been believing? What fig leaves have, been, have you been using to cover up your pain? Can I encourage you today? Trade those in and begin to trust in God, begin to follow God, begin to go to grace group, begin to read the Bible, begin to see his truth, which would begin to change your life.